Hey everybody and welcome to the 5 Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. Coming up on this week's episode, major developments in the ongoing saga of the Okta breach. OpenAI and Cloudflare each experienced significant outages this week, and Forrester claims as much as 20% of VMware customers could be set to leave the stack. For this and more, keep listening to this episode of the podcast, which of course is brought to you by my awesome sponsors. And that includes Numescent, the inventors of the first and only cloud-native container management platform for Windows desktops. And also brought to you by Networks Policy Pack, where you use Group Policy, Policy Pack Cloud, or MDM to remove local admin rights, manage lockdown applications, Java, browsers, and mitigate ransomware, plus more. And of course, also brought to you by ControlUp, end-to-end digital experience management for the work from anywhere era. ControlUp, happy users, happy IT. If you enjoy the show each week, you have these awesome sponsors to thank. And now for some news. In a story that seems to be a snowball rolling downhill, just gathering more and more snow, becoming bigger and bigger, is the Okta breach. I've been reporting on this for several weeks now, and recently I reported on details of how attackers leveraged HTTP archive files or HAR files as part of the attack. And most recently on episode 305, I talked about reports from 1Password that reported that they were affected by the breach and an attacker tried to breach them via an Okta account. Since that episode, others have reported being affected by the breach too, including Beyond Trust and Cloudflare, with each stating they detected attackers trying to leverage Okta accounts in their organization, but luckily they were on the ball and stopped any attack before they could take hold. Okta also warned that thousands of its employees' data has been leaked. Okta have come out and stated that their investigation of the incident found the credentials of a service account were saved to an employee's personal Google profile after they signed into the profile on their work laptop using Google Chrome. They said, quote, The most likely avenue for exposure of this credential is the compromise of the employee's personal Google account or personal device. According to scmagazine.com, Okta has taken a range of remediation actions following the attack. These include disabling the compromised service account, blocking the use of personal Google profiles when using Google Chrome on company laptops, enhancing monitoring of the customer support system, and binding administrator session tokens based on network location. That's interesting about blocking the Google profiles, at least personal Google profiles in Google Chrome on work laptops. More and more, it seems like Google Chrome may not be the best option in an enterprise. But certainly, if you do have it deployed, you need to look at all the security settings and uh, policy settings that are available. And I feel like this story is not over yet. It seems like the full extent has actually yet to be realized, in my opinion. I know I saw another report that suggested hundreds of customers may have been affected by the initial Okta breach, which means potentially more attackers have gained access to Okta accounts in customer tenants. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see how this one plays out. It may be one that just has legs and it's going to roll on for weeks or months ahead. At the time of scripting this episode of the podcast, Cloudflare were suffering an outage of some of its services or features. The issue started after a failed update caused a complete Cloudflare outage that lasted 37 minutes, which, you know, it's only 37 minutes, but it's pretty significant considering the widespread use of Cloudflare by many of the most popular sites in the world. At the time of scripting this episode, the features and services still being affected includes Log Push, Warp or Zero Trust Device Posture, Cloudflare Dashboard, Cloudflare API, Stream API, Workers API, and Alert Notification System. So several APIs that could be very important to some organizations still experiencing an outage over 24 hours after it began. In a status update, Cloudflare shared, quote, we operate in multiple redundant data centers in Oregon that power Cloudflare's control plane. That includes dashboard, logging, etc. Uh, there was a regional power issue that impacted multiple facilities in the region. The facilities failed to generate power overnight. Then this morning, there were multiple generator failures that took the facilities entirely offline. We have failed over to our disaster recovery facility and more of our services are restored. 
This data center outage impacted Cloudflare's dashboards and APIs, but it did not impact traffic flowing through our global network. We are working with our data center vendors to investigate the root cause of the regional power outage and generator failures. We expect to publish multiple blogs based on what we learn and can share those with you when they're live. So it's great that they're going to be transparent enough to share after the fact. And this is not the first instance of a widely used service and um, cloud hosted offering experiencing significant outages or problems after power outages in a certain region. I know Azure had an issue that I reported on. I think it was last year, although time is just a blur uh, where the data center in Texas had a fire and that had a ripple effect for services in other regions too. So not unheard of for sure. In an update to the major solar wind supply chain attack story from a couple of years ago, Ars Technica reported that the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, are suing SolarWinds and their CISO, Timothy Brown, alleging they concealed security failures that led to the cyber attack known as Sunburst. The filing brings some pretty damning accusations of ignoring security red flags for years and defrauding investors and customers through misstatements, omissions, and schemes that mask the company's poor cybersecurity practices. Ars Technica also shared that SolarWinds have expressed their disappointment in the SEC for the lawsuit, and Brown's lawyer, Alec Koch, provided Ars Technica with a statement on his client's behalf that read, quote, Mr. Brown has worked tirelessly and responsibly to continuously improve the company's cybersecurity posture throughout his time at SolarWinds and we look forward to defending his reputation and correcting the inaccuracies in the SEC's complaint. So this is another example of a security employee, a CISO, uh, being personally sued after the fallout of a cybersecurity incident. So while I understand it, like I said the last time I covered such a story, I do feel a little bit sorry because who would want to be a CISO when the stakes are so high? People make mistakes in their jobs, Technology is just inherently flawed. I'm not saying that it was the technology's fault in this instance. Obviously, they're going to try and prove in their case that there was glaring omissions and an attempt to defraud. Uh, but, you know, personally going after CISOs certainly sets a precedent. The Verge have reported that there's new behavior creeping into OneDrive. They say that when you try to close OneDrive on Windows, Microsoft will now force you to fill out a survey on why you have dared to quit the application. According to The Verge, the quit option is grayed out until you select a reason for quitting OneDrive from a drop-down box, and the options include, I don't want OneDrive running all the time, I don't know what OneDrive is, I don't use OneDrive, I'm trying to fix a problem with OneDrive, I'm trying to speed up my computer, I get too many notifications, or other. So that's kind of annoying. And then <laughs> if you're someone who closes OneDrive often, which I personally do, having to take this extra step is going to be a pain in the butt. Uh, I hope there's enough uproar that they reverse this decision. And yeah, uh, I'm trying to fix a problem with OneDrive or I'm trying to speed up my computers quite often. Boeing have confirmed reports that their network was breached by the Lockbit ransomware gang who recently claimed to have got into Boeing and stolen their data. This got mainstream media attention as Boeing has some very sensitive data related to safety of commercial flights and potential Air Force and government related details too. Boeing have said the incident did not impact flight safety and confirmed collaboration with law enforcement and regulatory agencies as part of an ongoing investigation, stating it is their distribution network that has been affected. So hopefully that remains the case. The ransomware gang have been threatening to share and disclose some of their data that they say is very sensitive data. So this may be a case that we'll have to wait and see. Uh, obviously, ideally, we would hope that Boeing does not pay the ransom. Uh, but I guess it depends how sensitive this data is. It sounds like Boeing are saying, well, flight safety is not under threat, so perhaps it's not that sensitive. Uh, but I don't know. We'll have to see. 
BleepyComputer.com has reported that in a recent preview build, Windows 11 no longer adds SMB1 Windows Defender firewall rules when creating new SMB shares, starting with the Canary Channel Insider preview build 25992. Before this change, and since Windows XP SP2, creating SMB shares set up firewall rules automatically within the file and printer sharing group for the specified firewall profiles. So obviously, another move towards stripping out any dependencies and any configurations for SMB1, which I know Ned Pyle of Microsoft has been waging a war against SMB1 for years, and it seems like a pretty good goal considering the disaster that was WannaCry all those years ago. Sleepycomputer.com also reported this week that Microsoft have introduced a new protective feature in the Authenticator app to block notifications that appear suspicious based on specific checks performed during the account login stage. The feature scrutinizes if the request comes from an unfamiliar location or shows signs of anomalous activity to block the notification from showing up. Instead, users receive a message that prompts them to open the Authenticator app and enter a given code. So this could further help when there is a threat of MFA fatigue attack, say, as users will not be inundated with prompt after prompt after prompt and just eventually trying to accept one because they want to be able to see the rest of their apps and the rest of their phone. Uh, they will just receive a notification uh, that there is a notification for the Authenticator app and they have to open the app to then respond to it. So they'll be less, I guess, enticed to just take the trigger action of trying to get rid of the notifications and just accept one of them. The Register have reported on a pretty staggering claim made by Forrester, who have predicted as many as one in five VMware customers plan to jump off the VMware stack. The article cites cost increases, degradation of support, and combining of products to sell as part of a subscription as reasons. The analyst House believes that many of VMware's enterprise clients are exploring alternatives to its virtualization, cloud management, end-user computing, and hyper-converged infrastructure products, despite the company's dominance in these technologies, according to the register. Uh, yeah, I find it interesting because just even the business of these companies like Citrix and VMware being acquired by these uh, other companies is enough reason for organizations and customers to uh, maybe do a double take and think, well, what's the future of this product? What's the future of the license agreements? And should we be here or should we go to someone that's a little more stable and someone that's not going to change and someone we already have existing uh, partnerships or deals with as well? So, I mean, the obvious one there then is Microsoft, which Personally, I would say from a technology perspective, Microsoft does not have the best offering in the market, but they are certainly, as a business, in the best position to capitalize. I think it's a bit unfortunate because competition in this space is good for everyone. And if the screw is turned and most companies have to go with one vendor, it's going to probably stifle innovation and we're all gonna have harder jobs because we're not necessarily gonna be using the best products and the best product stack and the best management features. In other VMware news, VMware Explorer Europe was held in Barcelona this week. It looked like it got pretty decent attendance from the videos and the pictures I've seen on social media. Uh, I recorded this on Wednesday night, uh, my time in Ireland, and I didn't see a whole lot of news and announcements coming out from the event. Uh, rather, it seemed like it was more, I guess, emphasizing previous announcements, like they went very heavy into uh, multi-cloud again, which is obvious, uh, using VMware's management uh, products to manage not only your on-premises uh, data center, everything uh, that you manage typically day-to-day -day in your VMware environment, but also to be able to manage across multiple clouds with the same tooling. So that single pane of glass for managing across pretty much anywhere. Uh, but they also emphasized some of their AI capabilities. Uh, they did introduce uh, VMware's private AI with Intel, which they say is a new collaborative effort to help enterprises build and deploy AI models and boost AI performance 
by harnessing the power of VMware Cloud Foundation and Intel's AI software suite processors and hardware accelerators. They also announced a collaboration between IBM and VMware uh, to bring IBM's Watson X to on-premises environments. They introduced VMware Data Services Manager, which they say empowers IT to manage data services running on VMware Cloud consistently and more securely. And there were some new VMware Cloud Foundation advancements announced too, uh, specifically around modern AI, machine learning, and generative AI workloads. There were some enhancements for VMware's intelligent threat detection and general security. And at least at the time of the recording, I didn't see a whole lot around EUC, which is a bit disappointing, but I think that's somewhat typical. They tend to make the major announcements at the US uh, VMware Explorer conference or VMworld in the past. Uh, so a little bit light on announcements and more just emphasizing direction and uh, what they're bringing to the table in terms of AI and multi-cloud. TechRadar.com has reported that Microsoft and Oracle have entered a new multi-year partnership that will see Microsoft use its own Azure AI infrastructure along with Oracle Cloud Infrastructure AI to make its search engine more powerful. Microsoft's global head of marketing for search and AI, Divya Kumar, said, quote, our collaboration with Oracle and use of Oracle Cloud Infrastructure along with our Microsoft Azure AI Infrastructure will expand access to customers and improve the speed of many of our search results. Karen Bata, who's SVP for the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, added, quote, By furthering our collaboration with Microsoft, we are able to help bring new experiences to more people around the world. The joint effort takes advantage of Oracle's interconnect for Microsoft Azure, which enables interoperability between the rival company's cloud infrastructure. So this is very, very interesting because as TechRadar suggests, you know, Oracle, they've been growing year on year for their cloud footprint and just the size of their customer base, but they're relatively small fry when compared with the likes of, you know, Amazon or AWS and Microsoft. So this is a strategic partnership, obviously. Microsoft just does not have the resources possibly to scale up to meet the new demands created by AI and just the amount of compute that's required to be successful and provide the scale required for this. So leveraging OCI may give the capacity for the AI features to run smoothly. It would be very interesting to see how this plays out for Oracle in particular to see what their growth is just based off of this partnership alone and what I perceive as a huge demand for Microsoft's AI services in the next 12 months. It was a mixed week on the AI front as OpenAI had an outage that lasted several hours, but WindowsCentral.com also reported that Microsoft plans to make Copilot available on Windows 10 in an upcoming update. So snakes and ladders, I guess. Uh, Windows Central claimed that this is an exclusive report that they have, and they simply just cite insiders. So a little bit vague and ominous. But I figured it was worth reporting because that would be a pretty significant development. That uh, would mean possibly not using AI to incentivize people just to get to Windows 11 and rather open it up so that they can grab as much users as possible. But I did want to qualify as this is an exclusive story I have not seen this reported elsewhere, and it cites just an insider without a name. So for now, I would say take it with a pinch of salt, but hey, that would be a good development. This month marks 20 years of Patch Tuesday, which is a news item in itself, uh, but there was also a pretty nice article shared by Mary Jo Foley on directions on Microsoft.com, which is the venture that she joined after leaving ZDNet, and it was a guest blog post by Microsoft analyst Michael Cherry. In it, he discussed how much has changed in the landscape over the last 20 years of Patch Tuesdays, with so many security vulnerabilities getting patched each month now, and plus cyber gangs exploiting vulnerabilities and discovering new vulnerabilities all the time. It's just relentless now compared to just even 20 years ago. And today he said that zero day vulnerabilities and exploits that come under immediate attack mean that on the 20th anniversary of Patch Tuesday, the prudent approach is to patch quickly and just live with the risk of problems, including whatever a blue screen is called today. 
I'd say, yeah, I always say it on this podcast, you know, patch early, patch often, you know, patch, patch, patch. Uh, but I mean, there is a way to do it. I know when I was in charge of patching in a previous job, which was not that long ago, uh, I would be pretty aggressive with patching. Uh, but patching was, you know, getting it done within like a week rather than just like, oh, throw the patches out the day they're available and just hope for the best and hope it doesn't break anything. You know, you could do it relatively quickly and still be somewhat cautious at least. The article also points out what Michael feels are shortcomings, such as wrapping feature changes in with security updates and what Microsoft could do better on that front. And it's certainly worth reading and reading it would be a good way to celebrate and mark 20 years of Patch Tuesday. Finally in the news this week, the festive tech calendar schedule for 2023 is now live. And it is chock full of great sessions by amazing speakers. And the charity of choice for this year's event has also been announced. And this year, the event is championing the Raspberry Pi Foundation, which provides computing education worldwide to empower young people to create with tech. Now, the Festive Tech Calendar sessions typically go live on the Festive Tech Calendar YouTube channel. So there's no real need to register and give your details to enjoy the sessions. Uh, but just wanted to give a heads up that it will be occurring again this year. So the sessions will start on December 1st. And you can go to festivetechcalendar.com to check out the calendar to see what's going to be available on each day and what you're interested in. And yeah, if you appreciate what the organizers do and appreciate all the sessions, please donate to the charity. And now this episode, scripts, tricks, and tips. First up this week, Sasha Tomei shared that Windows Server 2022 installs Azure Arc Setup, which I think has been annoying a lot of people, <laughs> honestly. Um, and it's probably unwanted, as Sasha has stated, uh, particularly on Citrix terminal servers. Uh, so he removes it with a PowerShell commandlet, which is disable dash Windows optional feature, and then parameters dash online dash feature name, Azure Arc Setup, and there's a reboot required. And there's a pretty good thread going on underneath this tweet. So I'll share a link to the tweet with this episode so you can check out the entire thread for yourself. And you'll find that at fivebytespodcast.com for episode 307. Also, my buddy Lee Jeffries had a tip or rather relayed something that he has encountered himself that could be a problem for others. He's, he warned that if you have a Corsair gaming keyboard and he has the K55, and you install the latest Citrix Workspace app 2309, then your arrow keys, numlock, etc., stops working. Uh, he said it's related to app protection. Uh, so uninstall and then reinstall without this. And there's a potential fix that he'll update people with uh, when he knows more. So another thread worth checking out. And if you don't follow Lee or Sasha on Twitter, uh, click on the links with this episode to get to their tweets and follow them to stay engaged. Eric Lawrence shared a really interesting tip uh, saying that if your Microsoft Edge browser is losing cookies when restarted, ensure that your Bing wallpaper app has been updated to version 2.0.0.5. <laughs> so yeah, people are like, what? How is that even related? Why would the wallpaper have an effect? And Eric goes through a little bit of why that is and um, I guess some of the integrations within the browser between the wallpaper, but yeah, that one really caught my eye this week. Finally, Malware Bytes had a good article on password vault options within browsers and basically spells out why you should not use them. So if you're using a browser and you enter a password into a certain account or service and it prompts if you want to save that password, essentially this blog article outlines why you should not save your passwords into the browser and should instead opt for something like a proper password manager product instead. Well, that's it for this episode of the podcast. As always, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>